And today, I want to talk to you a little bit about a story. In fact, here's the reality. We celebrate that Jesus is alive. What we know about Jesus is that in his life, while he was in ministry, there were three people that were raised to life. One was Jairus' daughter. She had died in a couple hours after she was dead. Jesus shows up and she comes back to life. She rises up. We also know that the widow of Nain's son who had passed away while the funeral procession was in going through the city, Jesus shows up and he speaks to him and he comes back to life. He'd been dead for days. We know that Lazarus, we just sang about it, that he came back to life after four days when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. We know that Jesus rose again on the third day. That's why we celebrate on Easter Sunday. But there's more to the story, and maybe you haven't heard this part of the story. And I want to preach on it today because I've actually never preached on this passage as it relates to Easter. And honestly, I've never heard a sermon on it when I've been places and traveled and even looking online. I hadn't really found that many. And so today, the Lord kind of stirred my heart with the message that I want to share with you. It's found in Matthew 27, verse 50. Those joining us, wherever you are, follow along. Then Jesus shouted out, Again, and he released his spirit. Let me pause. This is referring to when Jesus is on the cross on Friday. And he cries out and says, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he does, here's what the Bible says. And at that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and rocks split apart and tombs opened. Wow, think about that. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. Wow, pretty powerful story. What I love about that story is here's what it says. It says that when Jesus rose from the grave, it wasn't just only to affect eternity but it had an impact in the world around them. And can I say that as we dive into the message today, yes, we're going to celebrate that Jesus is alive, that we have eternal life through Christ, but I want to focus a little bit on the fact that God wants you and I, you, you heard the song, that he wants you and I to rise up. There might be something that has died. Maybe you're here and you've been given the news that your marriage is over and they've delivered the, the papers for divorce. Maybe you've been struggling financially because you lost everything during the pandemic and you've got this massive debt and you think that it'll never change. Listen, so many people have walked into this room today or turned on their computer and they feel like there's some things that are in the grave. Can I tell you that the message of Easter isn't just that we have eternal life and resurrection one day, but that that resurrection can impact our lives today and it can turn everything around. So we're going to take a look at that today. You saw people, I don't know if you noticed in the video, but people that, one of the people in our church right now that's on our staff was in the hospital. They didn't even know what was wrong and basically was living in the hospital with no hope. But they rose up. And through the miraculous touch of Jesus, now they're serving in the church and they're healthy and they're strong. No matter what you're walking through, you can rise up. Somebody say that with me. Say, rise up. Rise up. So will you close your eyes? And will you do this? Just lift one hand towards heaven. Kind of like an antenna. Remember those old rabbit ear, rabbit eared antennas? That the, you had to kind of like move it just right so you got the signal. We're going to kind of do this as a symbolic act that we're going to line up with the frequency of the Spirit. Holy Spirit, tune our hearts into heaven and speak. Speak through the words that I say, but speak through our hearts to hear and receive it. Lord, let people walk out of this room. Let people turn off their computer in every location, wherever they are. And know that they've had an encounter with the risen Christ. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. Thank you. So I have two things that I want to share with you from this story. And the first thing that I think we need to remember from this passage of Scripture is this, and it's a powerful truth, and that is that God can open any tomb. God can open any tomb. Look what it said in Matthew 27, verse 51 through 53. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart, and tombs were opened. 
Now, here's what I just want to point out. It wasn't just an earthquake, and because the earth was moving, some, you know, uh, places in the cemetery where there were tombs that kind of cracked and opened. The Bible tells us that God opened the tombs because there were specific people that he opened their tomb and they rose again. And what's interesting is the word open there means to unseal. How many, had, how many here thought you had something sealed? Like maybe you're using, a, you know, what are those bags that have the Ziploc zip bags and you thought you had it in your bag and everything was sealed and then you opened your bag and it was things were, how many have ever had it like leak out and you're like, oh man. Listen, this means that it was unsealed. It was sealed, but now it's unsealed. In fact, in those days, when you were buried, oftentimes, especially if you're people of wealth, you would buy a plot that was in the side of a mountain and you'd cut out the stone and they would put the bodies in there and it would have an opening. And then, that, in fact, I have a picture to show you. They would seal the tomb with a large stone. It would take several people to roll it into place. And the reason they did that is so that animals couldn't come in and, you know, take or eat on the bodies or do things of that nature. People couldn't come in and steal anything that was placed in there. They would seal the tomb. They were signed, sealed, delivered. No, that's the wrong, the wrong idea. But I don't know. I'm just happy today because Jesus is alive. The tomb was sealed, but God opened the tomb. Let me, let me talk for a minute about that because, you know, the Bible says that not only was the tomb sealed where all of these people that had died, but Jesus, when he was placed in the tomb, the Bible says that they sealed the tomb with a large stone, like you saw right there. In fact, many people believe that picture is actually the place where Jesus was buried. They put a stone in front of it, and they sealed it. But it tells us not only that, that Pilate sealed the tomb. And the word sealed there in the scripture, when you read about Jesus being put in the grave and the tomb being sealed, is actually a Greek word, which is referencing kind of like in the days that Jesus lived, if you had a document or a legal you know, document that you needed to send to someone, what would happen is you'd have a scribe or a lawyer look at it, make sure, read it, make sure everything was correct and in order, then they would close it, they would put hot wax on the parchment, and then they would take their ring, their signet, and they would seal it. And so as long as it was delivered and sealed, you knew that first of all, everything was as it should be. Everything was correct. Everything was in order because it had been sealed. We know that when Pilate had the guards go and make sure that the tomb was sealed, it wasn't just that guards stood in front of it. It wasn't just that a stone was there. But what a lot of historians believe happened is that Pilate literally took a massive rope. He got mortar which is what, you know, bonds bricks together. And he put on one side, they had mortar, and they put the rope on that side, draped it across the front of the tomb, and put the, the rest of the rope in another part of mortar so that it was sealed, not just with the stone, but Pilate's seal. And here's what it said. We've walked into the tomb. We've checked his body. Jesus is dead. There's no life in his body. He's gone. There's no one in here. There's no, no, no disciples that can steal him. He's dead. It's over. It's done. And this seal proves it. That's what happened on Jesus' tomb. Now, speaking of seals, it made me think about Door, DoorDash. And um, some of you are like, whoa, that didn't, where did that go? I don't know. But how many remember back in the day when, um, when a, lot, a lot of people... Oh, oh, thank you very much. Come on, give it up for DoorDash people right here. I got a delivery. How convenient while I was talking about it on a Sunday service, right when I mentioned it. And remember when, when the pandemic came and um, everything had to be delivered to your door? And I don't know about you, but a lot of people were ordering food. Now, some of you are purists and you're like, you want to make it at home. But how many have ever used like DoorDash or one of those things? Wave at me. All right. How many of you just like never? I'm going to just make my own food. Okay. Well, for those that make their own food, you're going to love this story because uh, you're going to realize you're on the right side of history. Um, <laughs> so during, during the pandemic, everybody started getting food from DoorDash and stuff. Well, then about eight months to a year after that all that was happening, they did a survey, and it wasn't just DoorDash, it was all delivery companies, and the survey they took was they asked, and it was anonymous, they asked the people who delivered the food if they'd ever reached into the bag 
and eaten some of the food that they were delivering. And so here's what they figured out. Because it was anonymous, one third of all delivery people admitted to having put their fingers in the bag and ate some food. Some of you are like, I'm never going to eat DoorDash again. I'm sorry I didn't mean to ruin your Easter this morning. So what happened was, I think because of that, They started putting seals on the food. And if you'll notice, it just kind of started happening. And now when you get a delivery, like I just did from Starbucks, what does it have right there? The seal. And what does the seal say? The seal says that what's on the outside can't get into the inside. And what's on the inside can't get to the outside. Interesting, the Bible says that the tomb of Jesus was sealed. You know, it made me think again of, speaking of seal, how many here have ever gotten a box delivered to your house? Maybe it's from Amazon or UPS. I think actually UPS has a delivery for me right now. <laughs> Look at that. Isn't it amazing how that all just works out? Thank you so much. Give it up for Becky, my assistant. She even wore brown, so she would be like UPS right there. And... um Hey, if you've ever gotten a delivery, first of all, I love it when it's Amazon because they have this tape that's easy to break and open up. But sometimes you'll get a package and it just comes like this and then you have that moment. I don't know about you, for you guys that are out there that might pick up the, you know, the packages outside and you're like, wow. And I don't even have a knife, but I don't need a knife. Any of you guys who know what I'm talking about, I just rip it open with my bare hands. I don't need a knife. And so then you start trying to do it and you realize that it's not as easy as you thought. It. How many have ever had a moment like this where you're trying to open it and, and I'm stuck? Nothing's even happening right now. You did a good job, UPS. Um, it's totally sealed. And so what do you do? You start like trying to tear and you're like pulling it. And if you're not careful, you can't get it to, to, to do it. So then you just kind of start breaking. Anybody ever done this where you start just breaking the box apart? Something like you're failing miserably, Pastor. Miserably, Pastor. So then you do that. Anybody ever done that? Take that box. Take that seal, and then the next thing you know, you've given yourself a box cut. How many love that? And you lose a little bit of your salvation in a moment like that, right? Maybe say something you got to repent for later. Anybody ever damaged what's inside? Had to send it back? No, some of you are perfect. Amen. You know, it kind of reminded me of is that, that... Man, I worked pretty hard. I'm going to give this back to UPS. Send it back. There's something wrong with this this box. You know what's kind of crazy is, here's what made me think, is that there are people that showed up today and some things have been sealed in your life. Because here's what sealed basically meant when Pilate sealed that tomb. They're not coming back from this. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, they're not coming back from this? Look at somebody next to you and say, they're not coming back from this. And what the seal says, what the enemy tells you when you walk into a service like this and you heard the bad news about your portfolio because the stock market isn't doing what you thought it would do or you heard about your career because maybe things didn't line up and you didn't get those contracts you said you would get or maybe again someone that, that you've known your whole life and, and loved each other. Now they changed their mind and they've fallen out of love with you and so now they say that the, the marriage is over and the next thing you know is the enemy jumps on your shoulder and says, Aha, see, it's sealed. It's done. You're not going to come back from this. You're not going to come back from this. There's a seal. It's done. It's over. And then, of course, what do we do? We're just like that box. We start trying to get the seal open. Well, I'll try this and we'll do this and I'll get this lawyer or I'll take that class. And we work in our own strength and we do everything in our own power. And then what we figure out is that it ends up more messed up than when we had it in the first place. And we got cuts and we got hurts and we got wounds and our life starts to unravel. Why? Because of the seal of this enemy who wants to lie, steal, destroy, kill. He wants to rob you of every promise that God has in your life. But let me tell you some good news. 
news. You're here on Easter morning, and what Easter morning says is that we serve a God who can unseal the grave, who can do the miraculous, who can take the dead, and he can make it alive. He can turn it all around. Whether it's two hours like Jairus' daughter, whether it's four days like Lazarus, or whether it's two months like the graves that were opened. It doesn't matter what the devil has said. It doesn't matter what the world has said. We serve a God that can open any tomb. God can do it for you. Somebody shout amen. He unseals. And you know what's cool is not only does he unseal the graves of life, because that's what happened on, on this story on Easter Sunday. People rose up literally and went into the city. It didn't just affect eternity. It affected their life today. God can change your family just like he did in this story. He can turn it around. And here's what's cool. When God unseals it and he sets you free, the cool thing is then he says, I love you so much, I'm going to put my seal on you. Because Ephesians chapter 1 says that you and I, when we believe in Jesus, we have been sealed with the sign of the Holy Spirit, which means this. Not only can God bring the things that are dead back to life, but he can put his seal on you and you can declare no weapon formed against me will prosper. And every tongue that rises up will be judged that brings condemnation. Why? Because God has set his seal of grace and protection on our life. Today, good news, God can open any Tomb. Shout amen. amen. So, so here's the thing. Tell yourself this. I can come back from this. I can come back from this. Why? Not through my own strength. Not through trying to open the box myself. But through Jesus. He opens the tomb. Here's the second thing I want to share with you. Second thought, and before I do, though, is since we're speaking about seals, what was the seal? It was there to stop what was on the outside to getting what's on the inside. But if Jesus can open a seal, so can I, amen. Because there was goodness waiting for me inside this, the seal. Think about it. There's goodness waiting for you. He said, I know the thoughts I have towards you, but hope in a future. The devil will try to keep you away, but don't let the devil stop you. You just let Jesus break that seal <laughs> and get the goodness that God has for you. <laughs> Happy Easter. Thank you very much. Point number two is this. I think the message is not only that cake pops are awesome, <laughs> but that God is speaking this weekend for, for us to rise up and leave the graveyard behind. Amen. Rise up and leave the graveyard behind. Look what the scripture says. It says, the body of many godly men and women who had died, were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. Now, I know this might seem strange. It might be hard to wrap your brain around, and there are things about this story we don't know. But I do want to focus for a second on what we do know. And what we do know is this, is that godly people who'd recently died, could have been a week, two a month, five months, who had believed in Jesus came back to life again, were resurrected because of Jesus. And I want to point this out because this is our hope. Our hope is that one day, because here's the point, one day you and I will die. If Jesus doesn't return, we will die in this body. But because Jesus rose again, because he died, look what he says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. First Corinthians says it this way, that Jesus is the first fruits of resurrection. 
And because he rose, he says in John chapter 14, because I live, you shall live also. Listen, that's the good news of Easter, is that one day, beyond this world, we will die. But if we believe in Jesus, we will rise to be with him in heaven forever. The Bible says he went to prepare a place for us in heaven, and you and I can experience eternal life forever with those who love Jesus for all eternity. Why? Because Jesus rose again. He conquered death. He conquered sin. And so these people, because they believed in Jesus, they rose and they rose again. Now, a couple things I, I can't really go into, but were they resurrected with a glorified body like Jesus? where Jesus was able to eat food and had scars. He showed Thomas. But also, the Bible talks about him going through a wall because the disciples were inside with the, the wall shut up, the door shut up, and he walked through. Come on, that's a cool glorified body. <laughs> I can't wait to do that. Isn't that going to be cool? Literally, you can pop into your neighbor's house. Amen. <laughs> or did they have resuscitated bodies like Lazarus, where they were risen from the dead, they raised from the dead, and they lived the rest of their life and died again. And they had two deaths. We don't know which is which. But we know that they rose. Why? We have hope. Why? See, and, and that's where I had someone come up to me after service and they said, Pastor, we've been struggling because we had someone, an aunt who died and we've been having a hard time. We wanted to be healed. And, and sometimes in life, we don't get what we want here. But how many know because of Jesus, this aunt got her healing? Because in heaven, there's no sickness and there's no disease and there's no sorrow. That's the hope of the resurrection. The other thing, though, I want to point out is that they rose up and they left the cemetery behind. They rose up and they left the cemetery behind. They didn't stay in the grave. They didn't stay at the cemetery. They went back into Jerusalem. And I want to focus for a second on this idea because there's a part of the story that we kind of read through quickly. And if you don't really pay attention, you forget about. Look what it says at the beginning of this passage. And I don't think it's there by accident. Matthew 27 verse 51 says, At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Literally, there was this curtain called the veil. We sang about it a few minutes ago. The veil was in the temple of God. Let me explain. There was the outer court where certain people could go. There was the inner court where only the priests could go. And that had the table of showbread and the altar of incense. But then there was this massive veil that was 60 feet wide, 30 feet tall, and four inches thick. Come on, how many know that's a thick curtain? And it was hung between the holy place and what was called the holy of holies. And because God was holy and because people were sinful and they had an experience like us, Jesus, who can forgive all our sins, they were considered unrighteous. So they couldn't go behind that veil. Behind the veil was the holy of holies and it was the Ark of the Covenant. It was a box covered in gold and it had a lid. And on the lid, there were two cherubim angel wings that went up and what was called the mercy seat. And above the mercy seat, the Bible says, there was this blue flame that just miraculously appeared and it just resided there. And it represented tangibly the presence of a holy God. But it was so holy, no one could go back there except one person, one time a year, and that was the high priest. And even the high priest, when he went, he had to come in carrying the blood of an innocent lamb that was sacrificed for sin. And when he walked behind the veil and he walked into God's presence, he would sprinkle the blood so that he had access because of forgiveness from the blood. But here's what's crazy. When he went in, they made him tie a rope around his waist. And here's why. Because he was supposed to go through the right process of purification. And if he wasn't pure and righteous, he could die in the presence of a holy God. So that why, that's why they had a rope. Because they couldn't go get him. They had to drag him out. How many of you, if you were signing up for a new job, they said, hey, we got a room over here. We're going to send you in. Here's a rope. Tie this around your waist. <laughs> I hope things go well. If they don't, well... We're going to drag you out. <laughs> I might like, you know, I think I'm going to ch check and see if anybody else is hiring. <laughs> the point of the whole thing is that the people of God were separated from his presence. 
But what I love about this story is that when Jesus said it's finished I, and I commit my spirit to you and the earthquake came, here's what it basically said is that God literally ripped the veil from top to bottom. And what was he doing? He was inviting people into to draw close and have a relationship with him, to step closer and be in his presence. You know, that's why the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 and 21, it says, since we have this confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain, that is his body. See, ultimately his body was the thing that was torn so that we could have access. And it says, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. Now, I love this story because what it means on this Easter is not only that God can open the tomb, but you and I don't have to be distant from God anymore. We can have a relationship with him which brings hope and life. But there's a part of this that maybe you haven't thought about. It really kind of came clear to me as I was meditating on it, and it's this. So God said, from now on, we're going to step into this new arena where you can have a relationship with me. But all the Jewish leaders, they didn't believe that. So what did they do? Did you know that Josephus, the historian, tells us that it took 300 priests to just maneuver that veil around. That's how heavy and how thick it was. In fact, I was going to bring this morning, some of you will not remember this because you're like Gen Z and so on, but how, rem- how many remember a thing called the phone book? <laughs> right? And it's like four inches thick. Remember when they were like this? Do you know I was going to bring one today because there was this team called the power team and they would go around the country and they would do these strengths of, you know, feet, feats of strength. And one of the things they do is they'd grab a four inch phone book and they'd tear it in half. And I was going to bring one this morning to tear it in half for all of you guys. (laughs) Actually, what I was going to do is, first of all, we couldn't find them because they don't even have them out there anymore. But I was going to actually try to tear it to show you how impossible it was to tear paper, let alone four inches of sonely tight material ripped from top to bottom. So what happened then? The Jewish leaders, when Jesus died and everything, they're not thinking, oh, wow, the veil has been opened. We have access to God. They're like, this can't happen. This goes against everything. We're separated. We, we have to have the sacrifice, only the whole price. The high priest can go. So what do they do? They started thinking of ways to step backwards rather than moving forward. So they said, you know what we'll do? And we don't know this for sure, but this is what I believed happened. They took the veil because it was expensive and difficult to make and, and hard to do, and they just brought it in and they sewed it back together. Think about it. They literally put God back back behind the curtain and hung it up again. They could put God back in the box. They took a step backwards rather than a step forward. Can I just pause and say something? Listen, God was never intended to be in a box. That was Jack. (laughs) What's the point, Pastor Jerry? One of the points of Easter is that You need to know that God can resurrect you. He can turn that situation around. He can do a miracle. But then you and I have a responsibility to say, I'm going to step forward. And I'm not going to stay. Because what does the Bible say? They didn't stay in in the graveyard. They left and they went to Jerusalem. For two reasons. One, here's what I believe. Because God wants you and I to take a step forward. Some of you, God has done some things in your life. You've seen his miracle working power in ways, but you're still in the grave. You're staying in your fear. You're staying in your depression. You're staying in your disappointment with God because of what happened. You're staying in your sickness. You're staying in your brokenness. And what God's saying is, don't step backwards. Don't go back behind the veil. Step forward. Leave the cemetery behind. Move forward into my promises that I have for you. I know it sounds silly, but there are cake pops like you have never seen (laughs) waiting on the other side of that seal, that stone that has been rolled away. I think the second thing he's saying is this, is that 
Don't stay where you are because you need to go to Jerusalem. Go back to the people that you know that have seen your death and seen your brokenness and show them and tell them that you serve a God who can forgive sin, who can heal the sick, who can set the captive free. Step out. Don't step back. Move forward into the promise of God. That is the message of this Easter, that God can open your tomb. But you and I, it's time to move forward. Quit staying behind. Get out of the box. Leave Jack behind. And move closer into a relationship with Jesus. When I watched that video and saw the people sing, those signs, those weren't just made up things. Those were people's lives. There were people on there that had suicidal thoughts and wanted to take their life. And now God's restored them and they're living with purpose. There are people that were lost and far from God following a a, a false religion and they found Jesus and they're serving the kingdom. There are people that were living in the hospital, one person with cancer for um, almost 10 years fighting it and now it's complete remission. And guess what? He's the location pastor at one of our campuses. I'm here to tell you God can open any tomb. It doesn't matter what it is. So maybe it's time to take a step. Say I'm moving forward.